Paul, I read that after training in psychology, you walked around with a sandwich board saying, Hi, I'm Paul and I want to work in advertising. Why did you want to work in advertising? Um, I think the reality is I saw it as being a fantastic way of spending my time and actually having you know, that mi lovely mix of creativity and also business put together. But I do remember the time, the reality is, so the real story is why I did it is because I remember at university going to my friend said, I found out I want to go in advertising and there are three reasons. The first reason because the most beautiful girls work in advertising. The second reason because they drive fast cars. The third reason is you make a lot of money. Sadly, because I got married quite young um, and we started having kids, I never managed to get the full joys of all that stuff, but I still love being in the business. So that's, that's the real truth. You're a master practitioner in neurolinguistic programming. What exactly does that involve? I did psychology at university, so I, I loved understanding about people, and it probably all boiled down to I just want to understand a, all about women, is the, is the reality. You see, there's this common theme coming come through here. And I just loved trying to understand why, why do we do what we do? Why do we do the kooky things that we do? And that's why actually, in a strange way, it led itself into the whole planning, because what is planning about? Planning is all about understanding why do people make the choices they do in their life? And in many ways, we have this view that if we understand, we can control and we can influence. That's a slightly flawed thinking, but actually that's what we're trying to do. Now, NLP is a looking at the patterns of behavior that we live in. Because we, by and large, if you want to find the best predictor for the work, for what we do in the future, we look back at our past, past behaviour and we live within patterns. So therefore, that was what's fantastic about it. So that's what NLP is basically about. You know? And actually, I found it to be a, a profoundly useful thing because we then start to realise that actually we need to start, when we're looking at brands, looking at the values and the beliefs are the most powerful things that are driving what we do. And therefore, if you want a brand to be really powerful, you need a brand that talks about its own beliefs and its values. And then we connect to it at a high level because we use this metaphor in, in the marketing and the advertising world about, about brands being people. We talk about the personality of brands, we talk about archetypes, and we talk about relationships and even more we talk about engagement these days. And a lot of that these days is there for about how do we drive that and when you look at that as through the model of the lens of how we get great relationships we get great relationships through people who we really connect with and we connect primarily through people's values and belief systems because once the looks have gone then as such we still connect with people at a values level so that's why values is the most powerful way that we can make brands really relate to other people and similarly we've seen a rise in the popularity of behavioral economics recently how has that impacted on advertising? I think, you know, behaviour economics to me, just to be a bit controversial, is a bit of very clever marketing. It's a bit of packaging together of a lot of stuff that people have done for years and years and years and just said, da da, it's behavioural economics. A lot of this stuff has always been around, and behavioural economics is a bit like um, NLP, and they, what we're looking at is what actually happens in real life, and let's try to make sense of it. So we are seeing a lot of behaviour economics coming to the fore now, more driven by neuroscience. A lot of work's been done in the field of neuroscience, which helped us to understand the way we are. And the work done by, by sort of Kate Cademan and people like that have helped us understand that we are lousy, we are lousy decision makers and we are easily influenced by seemingly irrelevant information. Now, the issue about that is it is one of those things that can be very badly used and it's a bit like you know a hammer can be used for good things or it can be used for bad things i have a fundamental issue about how behavior has got to be used for good and not used for bad so i do not want to use behavior economics in a way of manipulating unconsciously what people are thinking of doing i think we've got to use behavior to stop brands from doing that because the transparency these days out there in the marketplace forces us to have to have absolute authenticity and clarity about what we're about. And so behavior economics is great if it's helping to make people save more, uh, eat less bad things, but I, but I do have a problem when we are unconsciously influencing. That feels the wrong thing to do, and I'm very conscious every time I talk to people about behavior economics that I really aim to make sure that we are authentic about the way we talk about brands, because if not, brands will be caught out.
So do you think it's more dangerous then to see advertising as a science instead of an art? Well, I think, I think science, I think advertising has always been a mix of the two. I think it always is. You know, like you go back to the old days, you know, about, you know, you can go and look at the, the, the top selling uh, sort of books and say, right, we've decoded it, we've deconstructed, we've worked out, these are the key things that go into a book. And you do it with, with music songs, you do it with films, you do it with that, and they never come out good. So there's a degree which comes about this whole thing. What's what science about? Science is about, un, is about control through understanding. If we understand more about the universe, more about how the body works, we can then control. And to a degree we can. But we live in a place of incredible complexity and it never quite works like that. So there is definitely an art to it. And if we try to do advertising by numbers, we'll come horribly up unstuck. And we're certainly seeing that, you know, when we look at what's happening in the research field, we've gone into a very deconstructive type mode. We can now, you've got certain research companies that say, oh, we should have the brand mentioned within the first 10, first 10 seconds. We've got to be doing this, doing that. And you just get painted by numbers and it's awful advertising. And at the end of the day, we're human beings and we connect. And the art is about this lovely emotional experience. And what we've learned from, from the whole field of neuroscience is something that advertising known for years, is we make decisions emotionally. We make decisions emotionally, don't fill my head with rational rubbish. It doesn't work. We know from all the work the IPA had done with Datamine that, it's, that emotional campaigns are much more powerful as a way to go and connect with people and drive sales in the end run. So actually, we've got to be a little bit careful about how we push everything to being this deconstructive, trying to control everything. There is a beauty about it. No one can predict, you know, the, the guerrilla campaign to take something crazy. You couldn't have constructed an advertising you know, brief to have got there. It was a bit of creativity. Well, it was wonderful. And we need to break the mold because as soon as we do everything, because when, when you have an advertising model driven all by rationality and driven by science, you end up doing the same thing. And creativity cuts through by being different.